welcome. The Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community is a regulatory science initiative that aims to facilitate innovations in pathology, as well as advanced safety and effectiveness evaluation. The PI Collaborative Community aims to harmonize approaches to speed delivery to patients through collaboration in the pre-competitive space. The PI CC is open to all stakeholders, public or private, including, but not limited to, academia, industry, healthcare providers, patient and advocacy groups. Meetings of this kind are an example of lawful activity under federal antitrust law, because the focus of the meeting is on government action or policy, including the industry's responses or positions taken with respect to their team. However, antitrust monitoring is needed for companies' own protection, since they are direct competitors meeting together. These meetings need to stay within protected subject matters and need to be monitored so that they do not stray off into inappropriate areas, such as pricing and price terms, sales and service territories for particular products, customers and customer territories, each company's individual decisions regarding selection of suppliers or customers, marketing plans and especially future marketing plans for new product offerings, other proprietary or competitively sensitive information. Today's meeting will follow the written agenda and there will be no discussion of pricing or other prohibited topics. If the discussion veers into those topics, we will terminate the discussion. If you have any questions or concerns about the propriety of a discussion, please raise it immediately and we will take a break to determine how best to proceed. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium acts as the formal convener and we will follow their conflict of interest policy. For additional information, we defer to our Code of Conduct and our website, www.pathologyinnovationcc.org. We look forward to moving the field forward. Thanks, uh, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for for your your bravery to to hear us out on on this topic on grand challenges, um, which is a which is a field which already exists for many years. And what we are going to to present to you is a kind of framework how it might be used might be used uh, in anatomic pathology. <clears throat> so I'm a pathologist. Um, I work in Belgium, research affiliate with the Peter Mac and. The the Trace Riggs Consortium in London, uh, working on immunity for many, many years. Um, as a hobby, I do clinical practice nearly full time. And in, in the evenings and in the weekends, I do this type of things with Brandon and, and Joe and many others. Francesca is a bioinformatician, expert AI person um, from the University of Nijmegen, from Jeroen's van der Luyck group, well known to you all. So <clears throat> we have. And that's important, not a single financial conflict of interest to any of the topics that we're going to discuss today. So before moving on, I would like just to quote very briefly uh, on an article that was published just last week in The Lancet um, by Topol's group, bridging the chasm between AI and clinical implementation. And I would just quote a few items in that article, which is just one, one and a half page long, and I strongly encourage you to, to read it. They question why is it that there are is a tremendous amount of AI literature out there, but few of those AI tools have been implemented in healthcare systems. And, and why is this? Um, and he mentions three items: trans transparency, suitability, and adaptability as key key issues for the reasons why AI is not yet there in most healthcare settings. Um, and I will just mention a few of his quotes. Many commercial applications are out there in radiology, which is true, but few of them are supported by evidence from published studies. And also that the algorithms were tested and validated in retrospective in silico data that do not reflect real world clinical practice. And this can extend to radiology, but actually to any field of AI in medicine, including pathology. So over the past three to four years, many people have started to think, how can we mitigate the risk of not being able to translate all this wonderful science on AI into our daily practices, which is actually true, because many pathologists still do not embrace AI in their daily practices. So we started to develop a program in which you will see the 
the first outcomes in a minute, and we will able to share the data, not today, but probably in a few months time. And we would like to propose this narrative using the tills as a biomarker, not because the tills are so wonderful, but because the tills are, as you will see, a good paradigm for many other morphological biomarkers. And all the issues that we encounter with the tills are encountered also with all these other morphological biomarkers. And this manuscript published by Brandon just last week, not the first one, safe driving cost, but the second one, is actually very useful because it, it shows that the FDA and, and in general regulatory science projects do inform the academic community. And, and the framework that we're going to present is that we need to be part as a stakeholder informing the regulatory science research and vice versa. The regulatory science research should inform the academic community. And what we're going to present is a framework trying to bridge those two communities together. And this is actually my final slide. And I will argue step by step, where does this come from? And actually the principle is very easy. You have two labs, can be industry, can be academic, and both of them have developed an AI till two in their own setting and they want oh. approval for it. The first step might be a voluntary use of a medical device development tool developed by the FDA, which I'm going to present in a minute, what this actually might be. And then again, a voluntary use of grand challenge platforms using trial data. And I will explain in a minute why trials are so important. And based on that, there will be, or we might offer as an academic community, those groups, industry, as well as academia, the highest level of quality data before they submit their tool to the FDA for a regulatory approval. So why the TILS? And again, I'm not here to promote the TILS as such, but the TILS are actually a very simple biomarker. And why? Because the TILS always look the same. Whatever in every disease type, a lymphocyte and a plasma cell, whether it's cancer, whether it's infection, it's a viral infection, which is an abscess, they all look the same. In this case, for example, what you see here is a breast cancer case, in this case, it was triple negative breast cancer and all those small round blue cells are the pills. So any machine learning tool actually in theory should be able to assess those pills. And the question is, and that's the debate for today, should every AI tool be able to quantify those pills in the same manner, in the same, with the same accuracy? And does this matter clinically? And that's what we're going to discuss today. Two examples. This is a paper which is going to be public in about a month, I hope. <laughs> yeah. This uh, pill counts in a patient population of triple negative breast cancer. You know, they, they all get chemotherapy these days, all of them, nearly all of them. Um, in the very young age group, younger than 40 years old, we collected the data set with 15 years follow up of patients who never received systemic chemotherapy, never. And what you see here is that the rate recurrence, just the blue line here at the bottom, if those patients have a high number of tills, just assessed by the microscope, and if you look here right behind me, they have an excellent rate of recurrence, which, which is less than 2% at 15 years follow up, 15 years follow up without giving any systemic treatment. Imagine that most of the triple negative breast cancer trials have a follow up of three years, or maximum five years. This is 15 years. The question that you may ask, should a machine learning tool be able to replicate this finding? And if you have two machine learning tools or three or four, and they are not able to replicate this, what should we conclude out of it? And that's the debate of today. Similarly, just look to the right. This is a phase three trial in which we assess the tills, triple negative, the advanced setting, PDL1 was not a predictive factor in this trial. The TILS were. The blue line is the overall survival benefit, and the gray line is the overall survival benefit, which is much less if you don't have TILS. And in the middle ones, you see the chemotherapy benefit, which is non existing for the TILS. So TILS do not predict benefit for chemotherapy. Oops. They do predict benefit for single agent Pembro, the cleanest evidence so far. And this has been confirmed or has been confirmed in other phase three settings. So again, also here, 
should a machine learning tool be able to replicate this? This is manual counts using a microscope. And if not, does it matter? This is reported as a percentage. Should the machine learning tool be able to replicate this as a percentage also, also is another metric also useful. And to the left, you see the levels of evidence so the till so far, objectively speaking, have level of evidence from before, both for prognosis and both for prediction. And how can we attain this level of evidence using AI tools? So again, that's, 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 that's a debate. So what are the potential issues that we need to mitigate to avoid the chaos that we're having in the field with, for example, PDL1 essays? Scoring tills using the microscope has a tremendous amount of analytical and clinical validity, both for prognosis, both for prediction to immunotherapy. Does this mean that any computational tool to assess those tills should also be able to replicate the guideline, which has been developed by pathologists? And you see two big avenues in the till field. Those AI groups who have developed excellent tools without taking into account the guidelines in those tools who take into account the guideline. Which is best? Does it matter? Is there a ground truth? We know, we thought, let's say it like that, that the ground truth was the pathologist. That's what we thought by convention. It's, is it the concord with the pathologist? We start to see evidence, and there will be a lot of new evidence out for in phase three trials, by the way, this year, showing that the concordance with the pathology is actually not always so excellent with the AI tool, which is not unexpected. Concordance rates range between 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, and something in the middle. But the evidence starts to indicate that actually, even with this poor concordance, the outcome prediction for tools for outcome in this case is actually pretty similar. So does this mean that the outcome is the golden standard and not the concordance with the pathologist? Is this true? And this, does this help us to move the field forward? Should we invalidate a machine learning tool just because the concordance with the pathologist is very poor or not? We score the tills using the mark as a percentage. To the right hand side, and this is a, an example developed by Mohamed Amgad, a brilliant guy, in which we, we propose as a working group several variables of till assessment. And I know that there are about seven different companies developing seven different AI tools for tills. And all of them have a different way of reporting the tills. We all get nuts with all those PDL1 essays because they all report the tills in a different way CPS, TPS, immune score. CPS-like algorithms. Imagine the chaos that will happen if we go the same path using AI tools. That's what we need to avoid as a community in a partnership with the regulatory instances. Why clinical trials? Very simple. An AI essay is an essay like any other essay, but it's similar to chemistry, NGS, ELISA, whatever. So the classical principles of, and every pathologist knows this, of analytical validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility, they all apply to AI tools. So every AI tool should conform according to the requirements, adapted to the specifics of AI and machine learning for analytical validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility. Many, many, many years ago, 2009, there was this breakthrough paper, I think, about how can the academic community, who doesn't always have access to prospectively designed clinical trials, use already existing evidence to validate their tools for that particular biomarker. And they have defined, so the authors have defined of that manuscript, which I just showed, four levels of evidence. The highest level of evidence is about the prospective trials. And if we talk on cancer, these are the trials mostly driven by industry, the drug industry. Most academic 
literature on AI have level of evidence DY because they use retrospective data sets. Sometimes very big retrospective data sets, thousands of patients, but it's retrospective with all the biases inherent associated with retrospective analysis. And what we propose here with the challenges that we are going to propose you the concept of is that we need to use prospective, so-called prospective retrospective analysis of phase three clinical trials. It can be also phase two clinical trials. This means we use prospectively designed clinical trials in which all the data was collected prospectively. The trial was closed, published, and the slides are collecting dust. We use those slides for AI tools, and we have actually level of evidence B, level of evidence 2, or 1B, according to the, the system. So nearly the highest level. And this is actually something which is very worthwhile to consider. And that's a proposal to all of you. So debate if you don't agree with us. So in the next slides, Francesco will um, talk about what is a grand challenge, the specifics of the grand challenges. We'll talk in detail about the tiger challenge that we have developed. And afterwards, I continue with the more, with the physical things of this lecture. Francesco, all yours. Yes, thanks. And thanks for the, for the introduction also, Roberto. Um, I think you will uh, keep uh, moving the slides uh, forward, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so the question, what is a challenge or a grand challenge in general? So we made this uh, kind of schematic overview. It's a bit uh, busy, but I will uh, explain uh, step by step. So the challenge, uh, a challenge, a grand challenge can be machine learning, can be computer vision, can be medical imaging, which is what we do. Um, uh, typically starts with uh, a motivation that can be a research question, but it can also be a clinical application or other questions that you can have. The machine learning can be about the data, etc. So it can be of different types of sources. Then this essentially is um, something that is picked up by uh, typically a research group, um, the, say the organizers of a challenge, and uh, Typically, the task for the organizers is to collect training data. So you have to provide the scientific community with some data that they have to start crunching and develop machine learning models. So then there is a column for participants here on the right. So what the participants do, they take the training data made by the organizers and they start training some machine learning models. Then the organizers also have the task to create a test data and a validation procedure, so evaluation procedure. So the participants use their machine learning model to train, uh, sorry, use the training data to train a machine learning model. They take the test data, they apply the model, and then they get some test results. And typically, historically, let's say, they would submit these results to the, uh, to the organizers in various ways. The organizers will evalu evaluate the performance, apply some evaluation metrics, and then these methods will be ranked. And typically, there is a leaderboard that is created. And here I put this kind of loop because this is typically in a challenge is a procedure that happens many times, right? You download the data, that's one time, but then you develop the method multiple times because you submit the results and then you get that the performance on the leaderboard as feedback to maybe change the method a little bit. And this is what we internally here, we call it the type one challenge, which is essentially the test data in this way. You see it's publicly available, it's accessible by the participants. They can process it locally and then they submit, the only thing that they submit is the result. And this is something that we are changing now. I will talk about it later with uh, uh, what we call a type two challenge. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so this, is, this was a bit about what is a challenge, but why? So why should we spend quite some time on uh, developing, organizing a challenge? Because it's, it's actually quite some work. And it's, it ties in a bit with what Roberto said. So there are many papers that every year are published and they present algorithms and these algorithms are developed to address a specific task and there are many algorithms uh, to address the same task but then the question is which one works best for that specific task and it's typically hard to say because uh, but what you find in publications is that every group basically validates the the algorithm on maybe a, a private data set which is only locally accessible it's not publicly available the code of that algorithm is often also not shared publicly. And then these data sets are also typically not shared. Although this, this is changing a bit because uh, there is an increasing demand for 
for open and reproducible uh, science and, uh, and fair access to, to the data. So challenges are actually a way to address this problem because you can have a fair comparison of algorithms all on the same data and all on using the same um, evaluation metric. Um, yes, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, one example is the, the Panda Challenge. It was organized a bit less than a couple of years ago. It was a challenge on AI for automated glison grading on prostate biopsies. So we know that there is a high interobserver variability among pathologists when it's about uh, scoring a biopsy with a glison grade. And we know that the, the higher the grade is, the worse the, the prognosis is. So then the challenge here for the scientific community was to develop an AI algorithm that could predict um, Gleason grading. And that was the, the main uh, topic of the, of the partner challenge. And next slide, please. So that was uh, uh, in 2020, it was organized and the final publication was, uh, was uh, or the final paper was published uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, the main things of the panel challenge was the training data was pretty large, 10,000 biopsies from two institutes, from Radboud University Medical Center and Karolinska Institute. And the test data was about 2,000 biopsies with a consensus reference standard. And this was uh, a challenge that was run on the Kaggle platform and was uh, co-organized by Radboud UMC, by Karolinska Institute, and then with the support of Google Health also. And next slide, please. One thing that I, I find very interesting is um, basically it's something that you, you see, it's kind of trend in challenges, uh, in particular in the, in the medical domain. Uh, it's a way to make the scientific community aware of a clinical application, of a clinical problem. And it's a way to kind of boost basically the knowledge, but also the performance of AI algorithms in that, in that field. So this is a graph that you can find on the paper of the Panda Challenge. You see that on the x-axis you have time and then on the y-axis the, the performance. You see that actually after about 10 days, the vast majority of the say, improvements uh, were actually already achieved. And then what happened in the rest of the challenge was a bit of improvement. And actually the score that was achieved after about 10 days, more or less, was already quite high and was comparable to the performance of algorithms that have been developed until that point in academic institutes, for example, in our group, uh, with much larger, much more time spent on development. And this, of course, also because in our group, we spent time on, you know, collecting the data, curating the data is not only development, but this is a, a, a nice indication of, you know, what you can achieve when you really share high quality data with the scientific community and you really invite the international experts on machine learning and computer vision to address a clinical problem. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, it, Panda was a type 2 challenge, which is different from the type 1 that I mentioned before, because basically the test data is not released publicly with the, with the participants. And this, is, uh, this uh, schematic approach here is something that we drew together with uh, Roberto a few years ago, and it's the base of collaboration that is ongoing since uh, 2019. It's basically about the design of what back then we called the TIL challenge that then became TIL challenges because we have two now. So essentially there are kind of two layers. The one in the bottom is what we call the, the public layers. So there is a scientific community that developed machine learning algorithms. The algorithms are then submitted, uploaded to a platform, which in this case is the grandchallenge.org platform. And then the platform runs the algorithm on test data that is not accessible to the participant and produces some output. This output is then compared with the ground truth. There is an internal evaluation to create the leaderboard and to apply the performance metrics. And then the public leaderboard is what the participants see, but they don't have access to the data. They don't have access to the, to the actual uh, output scores that are produced. And this is what we call a, a type two challenge because essentially the training data is made available, but the test data is completely hidden and not accessible by the participants. And as I said, this is now something that is implemented in the grandchallenge.org platform, which is the platform that is running the, the Tiger Challenge, which I will talk about in a minute. And actually also the Catalina project that Roberto will talk about also later. And next slide, please. Yes, a few words about Grand Challenge. GrandChallenge.org is a website. It's a platform. It contains many features. It's open source, so you can actually download the source code and have an instance of GrandChallenge.org in your institute if you want. 
Um, currently, it has more than 70,000 active users. It hosts 300 challenges and almost 700 algorithms. It can host archives, so data sets. Um, it has functionalities for setting up reader studies and uh, also for making annotations, all done with uh, a web-based viewer, which now we use for uh, pathology because we talk about the Tiger and Catalina challenge, but it also supports um, radiology images, ophthalmology images, etc. And the, the whole project is on GitHub and it's, as I said, it's open source. Next, please. Yeah, and then uh, grandchallenge.org is the platform where the, the Tiger Challenge is, is hosted. This is the link, tiger.grandchallenge.org. This is the front page of the challenge. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a type two challenge. So we made a training data set and we released it publicly with the scientific community. We decided to focus on triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer. We made a training set of 390 whole slide images, which contained about 1800 manually annotated regions of interest. And the regions of interest contain annotation. This is the one on the right is an example of manual annotations of different tissue compartments with these polygons that you can see like with the, these blue lines. And then the, all these uh, green dots are the, the, the TILs, so the lymphocytes and the plasma cells that have been annotated by uh, breast pathologists. Um, next to that, we also release annotations of what we call the, the tumor bulk. We talk about it in the, the next slide and also about TIL scores for a subset of slides. Uh, this training set is publicly available, as I said, it can be uh, accessed uh, uh, via uh, AWS Open Data Registry and we release it under Creative Commons uh, license. So next slide, I have a few details about yeah, the type of annotations that we released. So we released the training data set in three formats. So these are three different subsets of slides in the, in the whole training set. One we call WSI ROIS, and these are really pre-selected regions of interest where five breast pathologists annotated uh, different tissue compartments and uh, TILs, so lymphocytes and plasma cells. Um, and uh, so they made all these annotations independently and they had the opportunity to uh, annotate uh, regions where they were not certain about the type or the, the border or the, the type of cells. And then after that, we organize a consensus, meet, consensus meeting to uh, basically uh, resolve this, uh, these uh, questions that they had. After we did that, we merged the annotations that we made with two existing projects, which were presented in this meeting uh, a couple of months ago by Mohamed Amkhat. Um, uh, these projects are called BCSS and UCLS. So we kind of harmonize the type of annotations and we reuse this uh, effort that was made in the past. And then we made a, a, a kind of single uh, um, training set that we released for the, for the Tiger Challenge. The WSI bulk is what is in the middle. We made course annotations of regions that contain tumor cells. So essentially we made sure that outside of these annotated regions, there are no tumor cells. And that's um, something that has been annotated by three resident pathologists and with uh, support a bit of an AI algorithm to um, exclude background tissues, uh, regions uh, and things like that. And we think that this can be very useful for the scientific community to basically train algorithm to learn how the normal tissue looks like and then focus on the tumor region or tumor associated region also by using the WSI ROIS annotations. And then we have last part, which is the WSI TILS, where we have a subset of slides, which we only release in this format. There is the slide and single TIL score per slide, together with a comment that was made on potential pitfalls um, for either the AI algorithm or for the pathologist for that case. And that was scored by one um, breast pathologist with many years of experience in uh, scoring the TILS. Next slide, please. Yeah, that was for the training part, for the evaluation. How do we evaluate algorithms? We have two leaderboards. So we assess two different things. One is what we call the computer vision performance. So how good these algorithms are at finding the tissue, so segmenting the tumor and the stroma, for example. And for that, we use the dice score to evaluate the performance and to detect the details, so lymphocytes and plasma cells. And for that, we do FROC analysis and we compute a single FROC score by looking at different values of false positives per square millimeter. And then we combine these scores to make a single leaderboard 
to rank essentially algorithms based on the computer visual performance. And then there is a second part where we essentially ask participants to use the output of their algorithms to produce a TIL score, so a single value, and they are kind of free to engineer this TIL score as they want. So they can follow the guideline, the recommendations of the International um, Immune Oncology Working Group. They can come up with even new ideas. So we didn't put any restrictions there because we also we are also curious to see how the scientific community can address this. We provide training data to understand the morphology of the tissue, but then participants are free to come up with their own TIL score. And then for that, we take the TIL score, we run it on a larger set of slides. It's about almost 1,000 slides. And there we look at how the TIL score can predict uh, cancer recurrence. So we do uh, some kind of survival analysis. And for that, we train multivariate Cox regression models, and we look at the concordance index because we needed one score to essentially create a leaderboard and then rank these methods. Um, next slide, please. So of course, because there is still a mechanism where participants submit a model, this time they don't submit the result, they really submit their algorithm to the platform. Then we run the algorithm, then we create the leaderboard and then they can see the result and they can submit a new algorithm or the same, but with maybe a bit of changes. So then of course, implicitly, there can be some form of overfitting if you like. So that's why we split the test set into two parts. There is a phase that essentially is during the, the Tiger Challenge and there we use the experimental test set, which is in this yellow uh, part here. For leaderboard one, we use 26 host light images to, for testing, and for leaderboard two, 200 host light images. And this is something that we evaluate constantly during the challenge. At the end of the challenge, we stop, and then we still have a final test set, which is completely separated uh, from the experimental test set and is never touched during the challenge. And then there we do the final leaderboard one with 38 host light images and 707 host light images for leaderboard two. And that's only run one time and we do at the end of the challenge to essentially uh, define who are the, let's say the winners of the challenge and compile the, the final results. Next. Okay, so that, why do we do this? What is our goal? Well, we have multiple goals, let's say. One is that we would really like to, to use this as an opportunity to develop open source AI algorithms for automated TILS assessment. And I say open source because basically there, there, is, there is an award for the top three methods of leaderboard one and leaderboard two sponsored by Amazon AWS. It's in total 13,000 um, th um, US credits. Um, um, and uh, if um, basically for the, for the top algorithms, uh, we uh, ask to uh, release the, the code as open source. Uh, the second goal is to um, basically boost research and development on AI for automated TILS assessment. So following basically what we saw with the, the Panda challenge and uh, releasing the training data publicly, we hope that the scientific community really picks up this, this topic, the TILS assessment in breast cancer, and really develop algorithms that can be really competitive. And then with, the, with this platform, we actually develop this, uh, this algorithm. So we, sorry, we validate the develop algorithms in, in a fair way. So we use grandchallenge.org, it's a secure platform, and we will keep it open also after the Tiger Challenge ends. And we hope that this can become uh, a benchmark for the scientific community in the future. And because within Tiger, we will identify basically the top algorithms, we would also like to, um, team up with the developers of these algorithms and together also continue this research. It's also something that we are planning to include in the final paper that will come out of this challenge. And for example, investigate things also beyond cancer recurrence, like for example, the correlation between AI and pathologies, what Roberto mentioned, also the role of automated TILS in prognosis and, and treatment response. Uh, next slide. I think this was probably, okay, very briefly. Uh, what do we uh, provide to the scientific community? We have built uh, um, several tools, uh, a couple of libraries uh, for, with, uh, that people can use with Python code to put in their pipelines. One is called Hoslite Data. 
you can just install it like pip install holds like data for the people in the code that are using Python. And uh, it's a library that you can use to read the manual annotations that we have made in the challenge, um, cre create patches for training your uh, deep learning models, but also write the results in the format that is requested uh, is, yeah, by, the, by the Tiger evaluation script. And the next slide. Yeah, and we also released a, a, a very simple example. So it's a full pipeline that starts from opening an image to basically producing the output and submitting it to the challenge platform as an algorithm. Here, we, of course, we make some kind of fake uh, uh, output. It's uh, the segmentation part is just, I think, a segmentation of the amatoxylin uh, channel. And uh, the detection is just some random points. You see on the right, the green is the segmentation and some small yellow dots are the detection. but the code contains the main components that are needed for, for the so the, the participants need to uh, really encode, and then there is code to make um, a single algorithm, a kind of uh, uh, a container that can be submitted to the platform. So if you take this example and just replace it with your methods, you should be able to make a submission quite easily. And of course, next to that, we have also opened a forum on the on the Tiger website, and we um, hope that uh, the scientific community can. Uh, can uh, get engaged with this challenge and uh, we are try to address the questions as soon as possible and uh, um, try to quickly react and help the participants. So I hope that uh, people would really, um, would really join us in this challenge and uh, we will be happy to support them in their development. And I think this is maybe on my last slide, Roberto. Yes, yes. now I give you the word back and you can talk about the Catalina project. Okay, thank you Francesco. Now for the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, very briefly on the Catalina challenge, which is actually um, part of the collaborative till validation challenge. And, and the, the setup is a bit different because we want to learn some different lessons as a Tiger challenge. So these are two complementary projects. In this challenge, which is a private challenge, and I can explain offline why this is called a private challenge because the setup is different. You know? Um, is we used an already existing pooled analysis of nine trials uh, that have been published already, in which we know that the TIL scored by different pathologists in all these different trials have prognostic significance. And that's the, the, the trial, the study which you see on the top. So we managed after several years of a lot of patience and persistence to, and, and with the incredible support of those trial groups, four different trial groups, to get the h &E slides of seven phase three adjuvant trials. Um, and these are all stored in the platform that Francesco mentioned. And, and uh, the paradigm here is that clinical trial groups are very willing to share their materials uh, if you are very patient and if you respect their own procedures. The clinical data, however, cannot be shared publicly. That's owned by partly. We, we, it's owned by the trial groups and we use it for the analysis, but we can't share it publicly. So in this challenge, we will use two different machine learning tools. So we we'll put the bar a bit higher for this challenge. So what we do here, we have identified two different expert machine learning groups, Union One in, at ICR in London and the other one is Lee Cooper's group in Chicago. And we said, well, you have plenty of evidence that you can actually assess the tills. Now, now we give you here more than 1,000 HE slides of seven phase three trials. Give me the tills. That's basically the question that we asked them. So the full HE slides without any annotation at all. So we will run your tool on those HE slides and we will see what it gives. In addition, in this challenge, since we want to compare the performance of those tools with the pathologist, we will compare the performance of those tools to assess the tools using concordance ring studies that we have performed with the tools working group several years ago. And here you see three types of studies, ring study one, two, and three. And the interesting thing is, and you see the concordance rates, which are not that bad actually, is that the ring study one was an untrained pathologist. And ring study two, that's where we train the pathologists, we see a rise in the concordance rates. It will be interesting to see to what extent the machine learning tool correlates with trained versus untrained assessment of TILS by pathologists. And again, thinking about this notion, what defines a good machine learning tool? 
is it concordance or not? And if the concordance is not so good, does it really matter? And the lessons that we're learning with the tiger and the private and this challenge is that we need to debate with the community about how do we rank a good versus a less good. Even machine learning tool has an outcome prediction with a hazard risk of 0 0.7 and another one has an outcome prediction of 0 0.73. Which one is best? Can we make this type of statements or not? And even if a machine learning tool scores the tools in a completely different way as the manual tools, as a manual method, with a slightly worse hazard ratio, does it matter? These are the questions that we want to answer with this study. So the lessons learned from the Tiger and the Catalina challenge is something that we would like to be ridiculously transparent and share it with all of you so that we can take out the right lessons out of it. For example, it's more about just scoring the tools in the Stroman. One of the tools that we're going to assess in the Catalina challenge is the tool developed by Indians Group in, in London. They have several tool metrics. And what we don't know, to what extent does all these metrics add to the prognostic importance of manual tools just scored by the pathologist using his microscope? Immune co-localization, does it matter? And so in this phase, in this pulled analysis, we have developed a nomogram which you add age, lymph node status, tumor size, and the tills as a continuous variable. So we get rid of those cutoffs. And then we see the, pro the prognosis prediction. And we are able to include, and that's what we have developed statistically, to include all these different machine learning variables in that model to see whether that really matters or not. I expect it will not, but we will at least learn what it means scientifically. We'll see. In the abstract for this presentation, there was the word risk, and I, and I love the word risk. And just to, <laughs> we have a lot of risk today in, here in Europe. And, uh, and I, I would like to quote about this, this manuscript that we, um, that we published several years ago. And actually, the, the basic principle are always the same. How can we avoid that all these wonderful biomarkers and all these wonderful tools they will never get into daily practices? But it will be the happy few that will use these tools. And that's why we have developed this framework several years ago. And these also apply to machine learning tools. And risk is not a metaphysical concept. It's a real thing. And there are officially defined definitions, which you see here. So I'm not going to read it. The slides are public, by the way, so you can have a look at it later on. There are three types of risks. If we don't succeed in mitigating the development of AI in anatomic pathology, there are risks to patients. You remember my first slide was two different machine learning groups wanting to have their FDA approval and, and they want to do, and they have excellent tools, by the way, both of them, probably excellent tools but they measure the tools in a different way and they may not be very comparable to each other. Does it matter? How can we avoid that a machine learning tool in hospital A performs differently than another FDA approved tool in hospital B for the same biomark? This is what we see with PDL one In breast cancer, two FDA approved combined diagnostics, the same biomarker, the same tumor type, but completely different performance metrics. So the patient will or not get immunotherapy according to the essay used. And this is something that we need to avoid. And we need to learn from the experience of PDL1 and other combined diagnostics approvals in the, in the future. Operational risks, risk to study power and recruitment. I, I give advice to companies about the biomarker assessment in their trials. And, and one of the things, you know, I was quoting back PDL1 because that's a very easy concept to use. They tell me which essay should we use because if they use essay one, they have to include 200 patients. And if they use essay B for the same biomarker, they have to include 500 patients. This is something which I, don't, which I think is unacceptable. And then the risk to biomarker development, which is actually even worse. The risk to biomarker adoption is one of those risks. If we don't mitigate those risks, meaning all those wonderful AI tools to, to grade Gleason score, to score mitotic activity, to score atypia, whatever, will maybe never be used if we don't take care about 
the basic principles of analytical validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility. Let's look at this one. The first item, specimen type and collection. The risk is analytical risk. One of the items that we can mitigate with challenges, and this is exemplified by the Catalina challenge, is that we have slides, h &E slides from four different trial groups. Those four different trial groups have cut their blocks in a different way, have stained them in a different way, have scanned them in a different way. And we don't know yet, in a prospective setting with outcome data, does it matter? And that's why I like the work of Ravi Samala. Well, I'm very curious to see his work because that's exactly what we need to do. To what extent does all these biological variables induce bias in the development of a well-functioning machine learning tool? We have no clue. We have some indication that it may not matter that much, but we don't know if we don't have data with outcome predictions. Last year, a bit more than a year ago, we developed this narrative based on the pdl one ex experience by the pathology community. And the wording that we used here is very strict. And the first one is for pdl one at that time, as the example, industry should be mandated to do concordance studies for the simple reason that pathologists at that time will be the pathology community realized that, has this, that there are different pd one with different performances. And we need to avoid this for all future biomarkers. And we are currently doing the effort to translate this narrative to machine learning. And this is work in progress. Uh, and we will share the manuscript publicly, and I will talk about this at the end. Industry and academia should with a question mark, mandated to perform concordance studies with other state-of-the-art algorithms or standardized controls before an algorithm is submitted. That's where we need to go. That's where we need to proceed as a community and because this will help us mitigate all these discussions that we have with pd one and other biomarkers. Nearly there. On these reference materials, I would like to, to state a few slides on the project which is being led by Brandon and his group to create reference materials with expert pathology annotations. And the question is, what is an expert pathology annotation? And how much variability and uncertainty can we accept between pathologists before calling something a reference material? And this is the Medical Device Development Tool Initiative that Brandon is excellently leading on TILS. And it can be extrapolated to other morphological biomarkers. And I'm nearly finished because I see it's, it, time is running out. And the word which I like a lot in, in science is the word uncertainty. There is always some uncertainty in outcome predictions. That's the basic of statistics. And there is also, also this uncertainty in how should we define reference materials. That's also, there is also some uncertainty. Certainly when it concerns manual annotations by pathologists for grade and mitosis hotels, and Brandon and his group have, in a partnership with academia and the pathologist collaborative group, have developed a pilot study of which you will see the first data coming out um, probably in the next two or three months, in which we have evaluated the concordance between pathologists on scoring tools and results of interest, which is being used by many groups to validate their algorithms on. And the lesson so far learned one of the lessons so far learned is first of all you need innovative statistical methods to define reference standards is concordance just kappa values is that enough or should we find another metric and that training is crucial which is not unexpected so nearly finished just to just a few more slides a framework for testing validation deployment of diagnostic imaging in anatomic but i hope we try to convince you that this narrative, this proposal, this concept is something that we as academic community together with all the regulated instances should be part of and developed together because there is tremendous amount of data which we probably don't have the brains to find all the relevant questions that we need to answer out of it. So the purpose is you have two labs, academic or industry, 
they might use voluntary the medical device development tool, the reference material project developed by Brandon, so that we are able to compare those different tools. They can voluntarily use the challenges which are publicly available. And this will provide all those groups with the highest level of quality of data before they're submitted to the FDA. And then with all this evidence, we as a scientific community in our daily practices will know that maybe it doesn't matter that much whether I use machine learning type A and the hospital across the street using a different, because, a different machine learning tool because we might have the evidence what defines a good machine learning tool. So the next steps is pretty simple. And there are many initiatives in parallel. We got the data of the private challenge a week ago. So this is far the last we're doing the statistical analysis. We are very willing and transparently present the analysis at this forum to all of you. So that we can discuss and debate and take the right lessons out of it. We need to finalize and support the further development of the MDDT program, and not only for TILS, but also for other programs. And we are developing a best practices manuscript, which we started to work on two years ago, and then came some virus intervened a little bit, and then came the grand challenges. So we decide we do further grand challenges and then we finalize the manuscript. Thank you. Thank you all. And I want like to emphasize that this is a work done in a partnership with many different groups and organizations, and I'm grateful to, to all of them, infinitely. The Tiger team, the TILS working group, and all those friends from the Pathology Innovative Collaborative Community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brandon, up to you. Thanks, Roberto. Um, we are near the, the end time for this meeting, um, but I saw plenty of questions in the chat. Um, Joe offered to kind of organize those and perhaps have a follow-up um, where questions could be answered in more detail. Um, Joe, you want to say more? And Roberto, let us know if that sounds interesting. Yeah, what we could do is we could list up all those questions um, and, and provide an answer to and provide the answers to you and you, you can host them somewhere so that people can access them. But we can send an email to them. That's, that's also good. Yeah, yeah we are we are military people. We talk a lot. And that's, uh, that's our nature. Yeah, so I think the fastest is if you put your email in the chat, we will collect that and follow up with the answers in, in writing. But I think there's probably um, a lot of content to be discussed, meaning, you know, this is a bold idea. Some of it is somewhat unusual. I think some of these concepts, as you can tell from the chat, you know, outcomes, measures, etc., I think are highly relevant, probably related to clinical validity and can probably be used to inform you know, regulations or upcoming regulations. So it, w it would be great to hear from some of the, the experts here what they think about the idea. But of course, we're pressed for time. Maybe one thing I can add uh, specifically about the Tiger Challenge, we are uh, planning to host a webinar uh, somewhere next week. It will be announced uh, via the Tiger website uh, probably today or tomorrow. So then people interested in specific questions, even technical questions, how to set up a pipeline, problems with the code, with the submission of the algorithm, questions about training data and manual annotations and stuff like that. We will be there. I will be there with the other co-organizers and then we will uh, take these questions. And we will also have a couple of presentations about that. Um, we, will, we don't have a specific date yet, but it will be probably uh, somewhere beginning of next week we will uh, announce it on the tiger website uh, yeah 